get out. We want to get to work. We want to get doing some things. Lord, we just pray that you would just um, still our hearts and still our minds and let us that in, in, enjoy this time and realize that you're on the throne for whatever it is. And uh, again, a special prayer for those that aren't working right now that you'd help their financial needs, Lord, that we as a body can come alongside and support them too, Father. But right now, as we open <clears throat> the bread of your word, God, we do ask that you would speak to us and nourish us spiritually this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the book of Acts <clears throat> is about the growth of the early church, the first churches, that was directed as Jesus gave his great commission to do so to his disciples. He gave his disciples a commission right before he ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And Acts chapter 1, verse 8 really is the table of contents of what happened with the early church because the early church followed and did what the Lord said to do by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it says in Acts 1.8, <clears throat> it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, where Jesus' witnesses, where? In Jerusalem, and then it says, in Judea, in Samaria, <clears throat> and then to the ends of the earth. And as we saw and talked about, the first seven chapters was the disciples being witnesses in Jerusalem. And so that's exactly what was happening. It was established. And we saw in these first seven chapters that the Holy Spirit was given, as we sang about this morning, it fell upon them. We needed that for the boldness to share and that the church was born, it was purified, it was tested, it was strengthened. The, the early, early apostles, John and Peter, were arrested, they were released. <clears throat> and chapter 7 ends, actually, with the stoning of Stephen by Saul of Tarsus in Jerusalem. And as a result of that, a great persecution started coming upon the church. And the disciples were now dispersed throughout Judea throughout Samaria. See, Jerusalem is the city of Judea, and then from that city, they spread out into the countryside and then beyond that area into Samaria. And that was chapter 8 through chapter 12. And chapter 8 through chapter 12, we, we read about Philip, who was one of the seven, one of the early seven that helped with the dispersal of the food and the dispersal of the goods to the widows. And he actually went up into certain areas there. And we see here in this little map that he went up and he started sharing in Judea, started sharing in Samaria. He came back down. He met the eunuch on the road to Gaza. And then he went on up and shared the gospel all the way up and came into Samaria, into Caesarea, also up in the Samaria region. So we see that through Philip that it was being spread out. And then Peter also spread out. He went to Caesarea. He saved Cornelius, the Roman centurion, and his family. And the gospel is now reaching out beyond Jerusalem, now actually beyond Judea all the way through. Well, in fact, we started seeing that tradition started being broken. Things started changing. A, a Gentile didn't have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. This was pretty significant, we saw in those, in those chapters there. In fact, God uh, said to Peter, do not call clean, unclean, what I have now called clean, referring to the Gentiles. Well, we then see in this next slide that in chapter 11, that he started going to Antioch. And up there, a multitude started getting saved up in Antioch. In fact, there was an outreach to Antioch from people from Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, and from people from Serene. And a church was established and an outreach to the Gentiles there in Antioch. In fact, they got so busy <clears throat> that, the, that the elders, the Christians in Jerusalem, sent Barnabas all the way up to Antioch to help with the teaching. And the, the church was multiplying. It was spreading. And so Barnabas thought of a friend of his, someone that was saved years ago, somebody that he introduced to the Christians in Jerusalem, and his name was Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus was actually staying in Tarsus at this time. And so Barnabas went to Tarsus and brought Saul over to Antioch. And for a year, they taught this church in 
Antioch. And so this kind of concludes, and the church started to enlarge at that point. The gospel was spreading, lives were being changed. The church was now breaking traditions, and this church was being established strongly. And now that picks up this last section that we have in, in the uh, book of Acts. See, so the last section is Acts chapter 13 through 28. And in Acts 13 through 28, that's where we're going to start this morning, we're going to see that the church is now expanding beyond Samaria, beyond this area of Judea, as Jesus says. See, Jesus says, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, <clears throat> in Judea, in Samaria, and now we see to the ends of the earth. And that's what's happening. We're going to see that the church is going to expand to the ends of the earth. And so... This morning, we're going to pick up our study in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, where Paul and Barnabas and a young lad by the name of John Mark, known as Mark, <clears throat> Paul and Barnabas had dispersed a gift offering to the people in Jerusalem because there was a huge need that was happening. And now they're returning, and they took John Mark with them back to the church in Antioch. <clears throat> so we're going to pick it up and they read the first three verses, and we'll look at verse 1. It says, Now in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Now it's going to list them. <clears throat> there was Barnabas. There is Simeon, who was called the Niger. There is Lucius of Cyrene. There is Manan. Interesting. He had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. And the fifth person mentioned there is Saul. And it says, as they ministered to the Lord and they fasted, that the Holy Spirit spoke. The Holy Spirit said to them, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. These first three verses <clears throat> have a lot of packed inside of this. And so I want to take a second to unpack this and see the application of God's word in our lives today. Verse 1 shows us there's a lot of diversity there in the leadership in the church of Antioch. We know that Saul and Barnabas, and they took this John Mark with them back to this area of Antioch. And we know a little bit about Barnabas already. We know Barnabas was from the island of Cyprus. He was actually a Levite, and he definitely had the gift of teaching. He was this encourager in the group. So we know that about him. And we also know that there was Saul. We read a lot about Saul of Tarsus. He was the one who found the, the Lord on the road to Damascus. But he had a real formal training. He studied under Gamaliel. He had a good understanding of the Old Testament scripture, a formal education. But now to these two men... Barnabas and Saul, we're going to see there's three other guys there. The first one is Simeon, who was called Niger. Now, Niger means black, and presumably they're thinking he was a black African. And so here we have a black man in the congregation of Antioch. Some people actually believe that he was the same Simeon who carried Jesus' cross. And if so, that's very interesting. We see a fourth person, <clears throat> Lucius of Cyrene. Now, Cyrene is also from Africa. It's from the area of Libya. In fact, Cyrene and Cyprus were the people that left and actually sent and shared the good news with the people in Antioch we read about. And so he may have been part of this original outreach that preached and shared the good news. And then we read about this fifth person, Manan. And he said he was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. So probably this guy Menon, he grew up with Herod. They were probably childhood friends. Therefore, he was probably of the privileged class. He probably had some aspect of some wealth. Now, this is the Herod who beheaded John the Baptist. This is the Herod who presided over Jesus' trial. trial. And it's interesting that we see two men growing up together, but like a lot of us know, we don't always choose the what? The same and that happens for me, I know definitely in my life, uh, most of the friends that I grew up with aren't walking with the Lord. 
there became this time even in college where I went in one direction, my roommates, and they went in another direction. And that happens as a similar story in all of our lives. But the thing I want to point out here is <clears throat> several things. In this leadership in the group, it is a mixed group of people. We have people from different ethnicities, people from different classes, actually, financial classes, social classes, all being mixed together. People from different religious backgrounds, people from different giftings. It was said there was teaching and prophecy actually being there, preachers. And here was an interesting point. None of them grew up in Antioch. I thought that was interesting. So you stop and you think, what is it that connects all these different people from these different backgrounds together? Well, the answer is Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit work in each one of our lives. See, there's one Lord and one Savior of them all. The gospel of Jesus Christ, if you're listening this morning, you need to realize, is for everyone. It is the great equalizer that allows all of us into the family of God. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter what your social class is. It doesn't matter if you are a popular movie star or if you're somebody who's just working day to day or whatever the world may value. You see, we're all one in Christ because the gospel of Jesus Christ is a gift. It's free. And all everyone has to do is just say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I like how the body of Christ is like our physical body. It's made up of different parts, of different gifting. It actually says in 1 Corinthians 12, I'll read this to you. Verse 12, for as the body is one and has many members, but also the members of that body, being many, are one body. That's our body, right? We have all different parts. But really, it's all part of what? one body. So also is Christ. Verse 13, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. See, that's it. That's the commonality. We have one spirit, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. We've all been made to drink into one spirit, the Holy Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not the hand, I am not the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, I am not the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, that'd be kind of weird, a big old eye, walking around in one big old eye, where would be the hearing? We'd miss that part of the body. And if the whole body was hearing, then where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members. Here's it. Who set the members? God brings into our church. God brings into our body. God brings into the Christian body. He set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. God's the one who's doing the orchestrating of what the body is. And they are all one member. But if they were all one member, where would the body be? See, you need these different diversities. You need these different giftings for the body to function properly. You need a nose and a toes and an elbows. You need them all. You need one of them. You need a hip, a lip, and a fingertip. You need a thumb and a gum. And yep, you also need a bum. We've got to have them all to be a part of the body of Christ. The diversity is so important. So with this diversity, I want you to notice what this group is doing. It says in verse 2, as they, now look at this word, ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit then said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them, then after me fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. These are huge verses that I want to dissect and bring and talk a little bit about because it gives us a great understanding of how God works in our lives and how he directs missions. Please note that Paul and Barnabas were called. They were called by the Holy Spirit, but they were called as they ministered to the Lord and as they fasted. It may be a new thought to many to think, that many things that we do in our lives actually ministers to God. See, most people think and come to church because they want to be ministered by the Lord. And the Lord does minister to each one of us. But many people really don't think what it means to minister to the Lord. And I want to talk about what I think what the Lord spoke to my heart about is what is the difference between ministering to the Lord and being ministered by the Lord. See, being ministered by the Lord means what God does, I think, to my heart, to my spirit, to my mind. I'm the recipient, I'm the receiver when we talk about the Lord ministering to me. 
We come to church. You guys are at church this morning. We're the body of Christ. And we come to be ministered by the Lord. And he ministered to us. He touches our hearts. He touches our soul. We worship. The words that we sing ministers to my soul. It directs my eyes and my thoughts to God. We hear the word of God. You realize the word of God is just a continuing of worship? It's the continuing of declaring God's love to you, God's grace to you, and we focus our eyes on the Lord. You see, we hear the word of God. It challenges us. It encourages us. It speaks truths into our lives. And through prayer, we yield our needs, our petitions up to God. We fellowship with the brother and sister. People pray for us. They laugh with us. They encourage us. See, being ministered to by the Lord is a necessary part and a vital part of the body of Christ. And God blesses us so much. But while this is all true, here this morning we read that this group of believers was ministering to the Lord. And they were fasting. So now what does it mean? I think, first of all, the Lord is now the recipient. We're not the recipient. We're looking to minister to God's heart. The word translated minister, if you have the New King James, you says minister, it's, a, it's actually King James. But if you're reading in the New Living Translation or the NIV, it actually is saying worshiping. But the word minister actually means to serve at one's own cost. In other words, you're serving, you're giving something to the Lord. And we'll talk about what it is we're giving you got to realize the priests in the Old Testament would minister to God by offering a sacrifice for their sins first, and then they'd offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people. But guys, we've already been washed now by the blood of Jesus Christ from our sins. But the Word of God says, under the new covenant, we too are now priests unto God. It says in Revelation 1, 5, and 6, To him, Jesus, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. So the question is, as priests of the Lord, how do we minister at our own cost to God? What is it that we're giving him? We know it's not a sacrifice of of an animal, but it talks about in Romans, and we sang something about that this morning. In Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, as brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Write that down if you've never looked at that verse before. Because what God wants us to give him is ourselves. A living sacrifice. Holy, set apart for him, dead to sin, dead to legalism, dead to religion, dead to law, but alive unto him. And we do this by presenting our bodies on the altar to God. We say, Lord, I yield my life to you. Some of these worship songs we sang this morning was just yielding our life to him for your service. A holy sacrifice. God, I desire to be set apart for you. I desire to be yielded for what you want, your desires, your purposes, God, and dead to mine. The problem is about a living sacrifice is we want to crawl off the altar. And God wants us to continually lay our life before him and say, Lord, here it is. I desire my life to be about you, God, not about me. And you know, for many of us, that's a struggle. That's a struggle because we got this area of selfishness. We got to continually be offering our lives as priests unto him. In other words, our focus is on God. Our focus is giving our lives to him, ministering to the Lord. Our focus is upward on what we can do to bless God. And when we do that, several things happen. Our worship is different when we are ministering to God. I've actually heard people say, you know, uh, the worship didn't minister to me this morning. Huh. Huh. I don't know if you realized, but the worship team wasn't trying to minister to you. 
the worship team was focusing on who? On God. The worship team was worshiping and trying to please our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may not have realized it, but it wasn't about you. I think one of the most blessed worship people we've ever had is Pastor Bob. Pastor Bob used to come in and he put his organ up here. And he was a push a pedal. And some people go, my goodness. But you know what? Bob would lead and enter into the Holy of Holies and lay his life before the Lord and would lead me and others into the Holy of Holies. He may have been off key. He may have hit the wrong beat. But you know what? It doesn't matter because he was worshiping God. It wasn't about him. He was praising God. He was adoring God. He was ministering unto him. I read these Psalms, Psalms 27, 6. <clears throat> and now my head <clears throat> shall be lifted up above all my enemies around me. Therefore, I will offer a sacrifice of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, but I will sing praises. Who? To the Lord. You see, when we're ministering to the Lord, we're, we're worshiping God. Our focus is on the Lord. I think also our prayer is different. Now, these five gentlemen, were they said they were ministering unto the Lord. I, they may have been worshiping. I think their prayer is different. See, when we pray, we should be thankful to God. We should be in adoration of God. We should be in awe of God. Psalms 136 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercies endures forever. Psalm, one, Psalm 27 one says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God, you are all in all. My focus and my prayer is on you in adoration. We sang this morning, you are the one we praise. You are the one we adore. I, I hope and I prayed when you were worshiping, you were, you were saying that to the Lord. God, you are the one we praise. God, you are the one we adore that we are now ministering unto him and giving him the praise and the glory that he deserves. I think when we're ministering unto the Lord, God's word right now becomes different. See, so often sharing God's word and expounding on it should be a continuation of worshiping. God the Father and Jesus should always be the focus. It should always be about him. God wants us to come this morning right now with an open heart, a humble heart, a contrite heart. The New Living Translation says of Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices you desire is a what? A broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart of God. I pray this morning you have a broken spirit. You have a humble spirit. You're saying, God, I come to you, Lord. Your word is going to just cleanse me and do that work within my life. Wash my, 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 me by the water of your word. Do that work, God. I give you the praise and the glory, God. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. See, this is ministering to him, coming and yielding our lives a living sacrifice. Send your desire, your will within my life. We see these five men and they're praying and they're ministering on him. And we stop and we're thinking, their eyes are on the Lord. They're focusing on God. And they're saying, Lord, all that you have, we want to yield our lives to you, God. What is it that you want for us? What is it you want for our body? Lord, work on my heart. As Job prayed in 2312, I have treasured the words of his mouth more, more than necessary food. Job 23, 12. Do we desire God's word this morning more necessary? Are you eating the spiritual food this morning and growing thereby and being nourished by more than necessary food, Job said. Wow, guys, this is ministering to him. I think so often our fellowship is different. I like being the recipient of fellowship, but many times God wants me the one to be the initiator of fellowship, to pray for others, to bless others, to encourage others, to pour into others. It's not about me. Lord, I offer my, my, my life a living sacrifice, God. Use me as you desire 
for me to bless other people. Acts 20, 35 says, and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. He said, it's more blessed to give than receive. This is ministering to him. And the final thing I see is I think our service to him is different, the fifth thing. You see, it says, Jim Eakins taught last Thursday, and he read this, and it really touched my heart. Matthew 25, verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents. Now, a talent is a weight measurement, a measurement of gold or silver. It it is about two years' wages almost. So it's a huge amount, a huge amount, a treasure. And he gave to one of them five talents. And to another two talents, and to another one talents, each according to his ability. And then he left. He went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made five more talents. And likewise, the one who had two gained two more also. But he who received one went and dug a hole in the ground and laid his money, the Lord's money. Notice it says the Lord's money, not his money. It's the Lord's money. What are you doing to invest what God has given you for his kingdom's sake? Are you hiding it in the ground? And after a long time, the Lord, it says in verse 19, of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. And the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in the few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The master was happy. He was pleased that the servant took what was given to him and invested it for the king's kingdom, for the ruler's desires. He also who received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents, uh, two. And I have gained two more talents besides. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many, enter into the joy of the Lord. You know, God has given us many things, energy, time, gifting, talents, finances. And my question always is, what am I doing as I lay myself before the Lord to invest in his kingdom? Not not at all why I want. It's easy to figure out how I want to invest. But what is it that I want to invest in my time and energy for his kingdom? And I see these five guys there, and they're praying. And Paul and Barnabas were teachers in this church. They were the main core. They were probably phenomenal teachers. I was like, that Paul and Barnabas be your teacher. You'd be blessed. See, they were occupying. They were doing the work of the ministry and pouring their lives out as whatever God wants. I'm sure when Barnabas went over and got Saul and said, Saul, I need you, Saul said, I'm all in. What do you want? When the church of Jerusalem sent Barnabas north, I want you to go up to this outpost in Antioch. I want you to teach them. Barnabas goes, sounds good. I'm there. I'm all in. Sounds good to me. What has our heavenly Father entrusted you with? What gifting do you have? What energy and resources and talents are you investing for his kingdom's sake? I believe when we're doing this, guys, we're ministering unto him. He's the focus of all that we do. Psalm 4 or 5 says, the offer of sacrifices of righteousness. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. God, here it is, Lord. Here I am. I trust you. You lead and you direct. And here they are. They're fasting. They're denying the flesh that the Lord might speak to them. And they come with this heart to be about God, to minister to the Lord. And that really touched me, obviously. I wouldn't be expounding upon that. Now, so often when I come in prayer, am am I praying to minister to the Lord? When I worship, when I'm teaching, am I coming to minister unto God, to listen to God, to honor God, to serve the Lord? And that's what's happening, and that's what we're doing. And when that was occurring, I want you to see what happens here in verse 2. It says, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them to do, which I have called them. Do we want the Holy Spirit to speak into our lives and to lead us and direct us? That's a real honest question, and 
Think about it. Talk with somebody you're with at home. Do you really want the Holy Spirit to direct your lives? A lot of people say they do, but they really don't. They want to have their agenda and do what they want to do. And here they're asking God to lead and direct. They're putting their lives on the altar and say, God, we want to do whatever you want to do. And obviously, God wanted something to happen here because God spoke to them at this time. And I don't think of myself it was an audible voice, and the Holy Spirit said. I think it could have been several ways. Number one, we see that there was people with prophecy there. There was teachers and prophets. It could have been a word of prophecy. One of these, these, these men could have just shared a word from the Lord and spoken forth. Could very well be, a lot of expositors believe. It could be that they were praying, and one of them said, you know, I really feel the Lord is saying this. And the other one goes, me too. That's crazy. How would, I just really feel the Lord is telling Barnabas and I to go out. I, I really thought I was going to share that with you. And you get a confirmation. He speaks to our hearts sometimes in those, in those still, quiet voices when we stop everything and we say, Lord, talk to me. See, a lot of times we don't stop everything and focus on God and ask the Lord to minister to us and to share what he wants us to do. However it happened, as they ministered to God and kept God number one and offered their lives a living sacrifice, it says God spoke to them. And what was the word? In summary, it was a word of a calling, a new calling that would now guide Paul and Barnabas into a specific work. He says, separate to me Barnabas and Saul. See, before Barnabas and Saul could do anything significant for God in his future calling, they have to be separated to him. But in order to be separated to him, they need to be separated from something else that they're doing. And what are they doing? They're teaching God's word. They're preaching God's words in Antioch. Well, I want you to be separated now for a whole new work. That means I need to be separated away from something. Sometimes God's calling us into things, and you know what? We are so caught up into worldly things. And you need to be separated unto God, set apart for the Lord. But here, Paul and Barnabas, they weren't doing ungodly things, but they were occupying. And God is now calling them into a whole new ministry. Well, weren't they already called? Yes, they were. They were already called to be the teachers, right? And to be the preachers of these people, yeah. So what's happening? God's changing their calling. I think that they've been faithful for what they were doing. And you got to realize, the calling was from God, the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Amazing. <clears throat> you want probably the two most gifted people, the two most gifted teachers in our church in Antioch to leave, <clears throat> to be missionaries? Now notice, these five guys didn't go, who's going to be the teacher then? What's going to happen to our church body? They all said, right on, that's, what, that, that's the word of God. Then it is for you to go. See, the new calling means that they would stop teaching and someone else would have to step in the teaching. In other words, this new calling for them to leave would impact the church of Antioch, would it not? It would impact them. Their two prime teachers would now leave. Life at Antioch body would now be different. You realize that many people don't like different they like the same. They like the same music. They like the same teacher. They like things going the same. But God's doing a whole new work. And when God's doing a whole new work, we need to embrace it just like these five men embrace it. But why the change? You need to realize. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. See, Paul and Barnabas have been faithful. They've been obedient to go forth, to make disciples, and to teach. And that's what they're doing. And now God is needing two more faithful men, two more obedient men to now send out to the uttermost parts of the world. Because you see, they've been to Jerusalem, they've been to Judea, they've been to Samaria. But what was the fourth thing Jesus said? And to the uttermost parts of the world. Who am I going to send? How about these two? How about these two right here? That's what he said, to go and share. 
Some people have said, hey, Brad, how do you know you were called into the ministry? That's a really interesting question because I was just doing what I felt the Lord had me do. I felt I was just studying the Word of God, teaching, growing, serving, yielding my life, being open to what the Lord has. And the Lord called me. The Lord touched my heart. The Lord spoke to people's hearts. I, I, I wasn't thinking, ah, let me do that. I thought, Lord, I, I wanted to do whatever. Even when I retired from the education system, Lord, what do you want me to do? How am I going to now be entering into your ministry? I mean, Angela and I often thought, well, gee whiz, if I stop teaching and we could use a retirement, we can do whatever the Lord wants us to do and not have to be a burden or to aspects of things. And I remember Bob saw, said, well, Brad, I see you being the senior pastor after I pass away. This is when he had cancer. I said, well, that's great, Bob, because I don't know if I see that. <laughs> And we had this little dialogue. Uh, but I said, the question isn't what I see or you see. The question is, what is it the Lord wants? And that's always the question. What is it that God wants? And here, God wanted to send these people out to the Lord. Guys, I pray that as we, all you do right now in seeking and doing, that you've got to realize what you're doing is you're calling already. But many times, what you're doing in your calling, God is preparing you for a what? A future calling, a future change, a future direction, and we have no idea. Do you recognize that Saul was 14 years before he was called into the ministry to come down and join Barnabas? He was up in Tarsus for many years. I'm sure he was reaching out there. It was Barnabas that went and grabbed Saul and pulled him back down into the teaching ministry. It was Barnabas the encourager. And now they're being called into missionary service. Well, who's going to teach? That's a great question. But it's a question that they don't have to worry about because the Holy Spirit's at work and the Holy Spirit will provide. Ephesians 4.12 says that we are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. One thing that we do at Calvary Chapel that we've been doing for many years is we allow Thursday night be an opportunity for men to teach. Over a month ago, we had Eric Waterbury, not Paul, not Bill, not Brad. Eric taught for a month, and it was great teaching. Last month, Jim Eakins, not Paul, not Brad, not Bill, taught for a month, and it was phenomenal. Derek McFarland, tune in Thursday. He's teaching. See, God wants us to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Our desire is to replicate ourselves. We don't know what God's going to do. We want to grow the men. We want to grow the women. We have different women teach and, at, at, the, at the teachings we do. And this is a huge problem within the body of Christ. It is. Many, many people aren't looking at what's happening. They aren't moving beyond their church, what they're doing. The, the pastor doesn't want to give up the pulpit to other people to grow. Doesn't want to replicate themselves. They feel threatened when God has anointed another teacher rather than embracing that. And as a result, many churches are left wanting. And when the pastor dies, the church closes the doors because they can't have another person teaching. It's important to let the Holy Spirit lead and direct every aspect of our lives. A.W. Tozier said this, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95 of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. What a sad commentary. 95% of what we do now would continue whether the Holy Spirit is involved with it. That is mechanisms. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn drawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everyone would know the difference. That's a sad commentary. I pray that we're part of the latter. I pray that we always are saying, Lord, you lead and you direct for what you want to do. It said in verse, verse 2, for the work to which I have called them. The calling that God had for the life that Paul had already been stated previously. When he was saved, God spoke to Ananias. In nine, chapter 9, it says in verse 15, he, Paul, is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. That's the call. He already had a call, but that call didn't happen for 14 years later. 
He was occupying, and God was preparing him to do the specific work. Later, Paul would write in Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. What? Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And here God has called Barnabas and Saul to these kind of works. God knew what he was going to be doing with Saul and Barnabas, but it took a period of time for him to be the workmanship that he wanted. The word workmanship is his poema. He's writing and doing the work within our lives and changing us and growing us. We are his workmanship, not ourselves. We want to be his vessel for the word and the Holy Spirit to flow through. I pray that you know, don't have a taste this morning of God's word it has any aspect of Brad, but it all has God. You don't want the Tupperware to be tasting the plastic. You want to taste the fresh word of God's word. You know what? God calls them and he calls us. And what has God called you to do? What service are you in right now? How are you serving the Lord? Not just what you're doing, but in what way is God doing that work within your life? Are you yielding your life a living sacrifice to him? And you're saying, Lord, what does he want me to do? Many of you guys are parents. I mean, you're a mother. I, I drove by yesterday, and I saw a mother outside playing with her two kids. And I thought, what a blessing. She's pouring into their lives. That's huge ministry. That's huge. That's what God has you right now. But that might mean down the road your ministry might change. He might move you into some areas that God has for a future calling. And I like he said, now separate to me. In other words, this call was now. Do it now. I want you to send Barnabas and Saul now. We don't have time. Now. Now separate to me. There was no delay. And so it says in verse 3 that having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. The whole work required a total dependence upon God. And fasting and prayer again shows this dependence that we have on the Lord. Being called out into the mission field. No one should go anywhere that they're being called unless they're being sent by the Holy Spirit. There are some people that go into the mission fields. There are some people that go into pastoring or, or service as an occupation, but they're not being sent by the Holy Spirit. Boy, may we be sent and directed in all that we do by the Holy Spirit. And now they're being formally commissioned to this work by the laying hands of them. And it says, and they sent them away. The church, this leadership, sends them away. We're going to see there's two words called sent here. One in verse 3 here. The first word sent is apaluo. It means to let go, to set free, to release. In other words, the church is praying, they're fasting, and then they say, this is the Lord's work, and they what? They are releasing them to the new work that God has called them to do. We're not going to hold on to them. We're not going to guilt them. We're not going to say, who's going to be the teacher? What are we going to do? How are we going to get by without you, Paul? They're saying, you know, this is what God is doing. And we release you. We set you free for the work. It's all about God's will leading our lives. The Holy Spirit speaking to us and the Holy Spirit sending us out. Do you realize this is a first? Never, ever, ever has it happened in the history of the church that a church now goes and sends forth somebody, a body. This is the first mission that's occurring and somebody being sent forth by a church to spread outside the area of Samaria and Judea. And I want you to realize, this is not happening because of leadership in Jerusalem. These are a Gentile church mainly, and some Jewish people, that were, came to the Lord because of some people going and sharing the gospel with them. And now they're, Holy Spirit saying, I want you now to go from there. From this northern outpost, Antioch of Syria will become the hub of missionary outreach, not Jerusalem. I think that's great. They didn't go back to the mothership and say, hey, just want to let you know we're going to send out some people. Do we have your blessings? And they just said, the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. They didn't say, well, let me see. Should we go here? Let's do a demographic survey and where we should set this up. Let's figure out where there might be. They didn't do it. They, the Holy Spirit said, go. Go. Now. And they are now being sent forth. 
with no committee report, no marketing survey, none of this garbage that we do today. And I'm not saying this, I shouldn't say garbage. I think God does a lot of things differently. But here we just see them saying, go, just go. So now we see them sending them out. And I think it's sad how a lot of churches has lost their desire for missions. A lot of churches has lost their desire to go forth and to send out. I think a lot of churches about their church, not about their neighborhood, not about outside their neighborhood, not about all the kids in the high school, not about what about the people in Mexico. They're not about a lot of these different things. I think it's important that we have a vision for missions. Do you realize that we have the ability today through the internet to declare God's word worldwide? I praise God that the Lord has us set up and we are. Last Thursday night, there was someone listening to Jim from the Philippines. I thought, how crazy is that? How crazy is that? That we're able to reach in a whole new way. May we embrace the technology to be used for God in a powerful way and share the good news, not just in our Jerusalem, but now into the outermost parts of the world. And it says in verse 4, so being sent by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Hold on. Being sent by the Holy Spirit, I thought they were sent by the church in Antioch. Are they sent by the church in Antioch, or are they sent by the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. Do you see? The church released them. They set them free is what it says. But this word sin is a different word. This word sent is ek poempo which means sent forth or sent away. Well, the believers in Antioch released them. It was only by the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit that they sent them forth in this power to minister. I like that. And all this happened when they were ministering to the Lord, when they were focusing on God to direct their lives. See, anyone can send anybody anywhere. But if the Holy Spirit doesn't send them, it's not going to be an effective ministry. And it says that they went down to Seleucia. We don't know of any work that happened in Seleucia. It's about 15 miles from Antioch. It's a port city where they went out from. But we do know that Barnabas was from Cyprus. And I just, I just... It's just, where do you want to go, Paul? I don't know. He said to go. He sends us forth. Where? I don't know. Uh, let's go to the port. And they go to the port of Seleucia. And the port of Antioch is just a, a, sh- a short area. And where do you want to go? I don't know. I, why don't we go to Cyprus? Well, I, I, got, I, I know people in Cyprus. I'm from Cyprus. Let's go to Cyprus. You know, in the early days when we did the, the outreaches in Mexico, we would take 20, 30, 40, 50, we took up to 70 people one time down in Mexico. And we'd get involved in all different types of ministries and street ministries and, and areas. And one of the things that I would just really enjoy, because we'd be sending out five teams, six teams, seven teams, and we'd have one team ready to go out, and I'd say, we're going to go share the gospel. We sometimes send out two street teams to go out into the colonials, and they say, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? And my answer was always the same. I don't know. But we're going to pray and we're going to ask the Lord to lead and direct. So we get on the bus or get in the cars, the vans, we start driving. Should we stop here and all this keep going? Kids pray. What do you mean? Pray. Where do you think the Lord's leading? The kids would pray. Lord, lead us and direct us. How about over here? It looks like a garbage dump. That sounds good. We'd pull over the garbage dump. We'd pump up the balloons. We'd go out on the highways and the byways and the people would come down. And we share the gospel and people will get saved. This is the leading of the Holy Spirit. Where do you want us to go? I don't know. But Lord, you speak to our heart. You show us what you want us to do. And so they go up to Seleucia. And it says in verse 5, when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John Mark with them. Interesting, this is John Mark. Her mother was Mary. That's who Peter's house Peter went to. And he wrote the Gospel of Mark. And they preached the Word of God to synagogues. See, the custom of the synagogue in that day was on the Sabbath, they would read from the prophets, they would read from the law. 
And then at the end, they, if any learned man had come into their congregation, they said, does anyone have a word from the Lord? And Paul would come, and I'm sure, dressed in the same garb and dressing that he would go on the Sabbath. And they'd say, do you have a word from us? And Paul would go, oh, me? Oh, sure, sure. And Paul would get up. I do have something I want to share with you. And he would share the good news in the synagogue and share them about Jesus Christ. And I think, you know, Paul looked for those opportunities. He set his life up to always go into the synagogue. We should set up opportunities for ourselves also to share the word of God, to share the good word of God, to have that opportunity to share the good news. This morning we're going to have communion. And if you want to get your communion, get your bread this morning, get your cup of juice or whatever you have. Just want to have a time where we remember what the Lord should do, said to do. Just as Saul was faithful to walk in and throw seeds, the seed of God's word, he didn't worry about the soil of the hearts of men that it fell on. Saul knew he wasn't in charge of the hearts of men, that God was in charge of the hearts of men. But he knew he had to just throw the seed. May we also just throw the seed and do what God would have us do. You know, Jesus, during the time of the Last Supper, he instituted the, the juice, the, the cup, and the bread. And it says in verse of Luke 22, 19, and he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is the body which is given to you. Do in remembrance of me. And he also took the cup, and he said, this is the new covenant of my blood which is shed for you. And that's what we got to realize that Jesus Christ came, he entered into humanity, and he gave his life so that we can have a relationship with him and with his Father and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And if you're listening this morning and, and you've been tracking and hearing the story and you're saying, uh, I, I want to yield my life to God. I, I want to minister unto him. I want him to minister unto me, but I want to yield my life to him then it doesn't matter, like the five believers, what station in life you are. It doesn't matter if you were the one that grew up in a privilege like Manan. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. It doesn't matter what your financial background is. See, this is the equal field that he's made. Jesus Christ came and he died, and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You, you have eternal life if you believe in Jesus Christ. That's it. And if you've never said, Lord Jesus, come into my life, I'm going to have you right now. That you do that, let's pray. Father, before we partake of communion, God, and do all that we remember, Lord, the greatest thing we remember, Father, is that your son, Jesus Christ, came and died for our sins. And if you haven't, and you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you came to forgive me of my sins and that the blood on the cross has taken away my sin. And Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. I yield my life to you, God. Take the reins. I need you. I need you now. And I want to pray before we, we partake. If there's anyone here, And there's areas of your life where you haven't really offered your life a living sacrifice where you, you've crawled off that altar and God's speaking to your heart to, to step back up and to offer and to minister unto him to keep God number one in every aspect of your life. And I pray that you would do that. We, 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 we sang this morning, Holy Spirit, the Father's grace, the promised one in Jesus' name. We need you now. We need your power. We need your boldness. This very, we need, God, you to do that work within our life. So, God, we, we pray that you take my life. We pray that you take this offering. God, I am willing. If that's your prayer, then just, God, do that work within my life. Forgive me of my sins. Help me not to repeat my sins through the power of your Holy Spirit this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name.
Amen. You know, when it says that if a person, you know, before he takes the bread and the cup, that he should examine himself, then that's what it means, to examine yourself, to say, Lord, where am I at? I give you my life, and that's what we just prayed. I want to give my life a living sacrifice to you. During worship, I want to exalt your name. I want to keep you number one. In my fellowship, I want to look for opportunities to serve, not just to be served. In, the, in receiving God's word, I want to be able to be the one that you, would, that you would have this humble heart, this contrite heart. That I wouldn't focus on all, maybe the, the words that Brad makes up, <gasps> maybe the mumbling, but more importantly, would focus on your, your word in my heart. That our, we would praise you. I want you to catch that point this morning. That God wants us to minister unto him. He, he wants us to minister unto him. He will minister unto us. He will meet our needs. He will do all those things. But God wants us to lay our life in every aspect. So with the bread, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. We are the righteousness of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Father, for just giving your son for him yielding his life, for him saying, not my will, but thy will. Jesus, thank you, Lord, for being that sacrifice, for taking my sins upon you, the bruises, the beating, the shame, the guilt. Do that work, Father, that we can yield our lives unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake of the bread. Then if you grab your cup. <clears throat> so he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said, drink of it, all of you. For this is the blood of my new covenant in which we are now the priests. We are now given the sacrifice of our lives, holy and acceptable unto him. Which is our reasonable thing to do. It makes sense to just yield our lives unto him. But this is a new covenant because this was the blood that was shed to enable us to have this new covenant. And it was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. He took your shame. He took your sins upon him. He took the wrath that was due to us upon him so that we could have a relationship with our Father. That's how much God loves you. You recognize that? God loves you so much. He did it all. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son again. We thank you, God, that you love us as we are. <clears throat> you didn't say, get your life together, and then I will love you. You loved us as we are. You sent your son to a lost and dying world. You sent your son to a condemned world. That Jesus didn't come in the world to condemn the world, but the world might be saved through him. We thank you, Lord, that there is no condemnation for those of us that have received Jesus, that are in Christ Jesus. And for that, we adore you and we give you the praise. In Jesus' name, let's partake. May God bless you. May he keep you. May you look for those opportunities to throw the seed. May you allow him through the power of the Holy Spirit to speak to your lives. God bless you guys. Amen.